Hoop Heads Podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. There's a reason why we're doing it this way, and it's not because I'm lazy, right? And and again, if you're just letting them play and you're on your phone texting, yeah, you're not coaching, right? But but letting the game happen and coaching over the top of the game and asking a, a kid, hey, what'd you see out there in that situation or why'd you make that decision? That's coaching, right? And then depending on their ability, you can break it down into, you know what, we're, we're not, you know, in this moment good enough to do this. We're not going to get enough shots off if we're playing three against three. So it might have to be three against one in the beginning, right? So that we're creating more shots and we're getting more repetitions of that. But to make it three against zero, that doesn't make any sense because there's no defender. So therefore there's no decision. Um, So therefore all the cues that tell me in this moment, I should pass or I should shoot, or I should, you know, um, you know, take a jump shot versus drive the hoop. They're all gone. Right. And if I remove all the cues, then when I play the game on Saturday and all the cues pop up that tell me what to do, I've never seen them before. So all that great, you know, three on zero work um, doesn't it does, there's no transfer. It doesn't translate to the game. John O'Sullivan started the Changing the Game project in 2012 after two decades as a soccer player and coach on the youth high school, college, and professional level. He is the author of the number one selling books, Changing the Game, The Parent's Guide to Raising Happy, High-Performing Athletes, Giving Youth Sports Back to Our Kids, and Is It Wise to Specialize? John's work has been featured in the Huffington Post, CNN.com, Outside Magazine, ESPN.com, Soccer America, and numerous other publications. He is an internationally known speaker for coaches, parents, and youth sports organizations, and has spoken for TEDx, the National Soccer Coaches Association of America, U.S. Lacrosse, IMG Academy, and at numerous other events throughout the U.S., Canada, Asia, and Europe. John brings a wealth of practical, hands-on knowledge garnered through years of working with players and their families on sports-specific development, fitness and nutrition, college recruiting, and most importantly, training high-performing athletes by creating a player-centered environment. Originally from New York, John is a 1994 graduate of Fordham University, where he was a team captain as a senior and a member of the 1990 Patriot League championship team. After a stint playing professionally for the Wilmington, North Carolina Hammerheads of the USL, John began his coaching career as the varsity boys soccer coach at Cardinal Gibbons High School in Raleigh, North Carolina. He then moved on to become the assistant men's and women's soccer coach at the University of Vermont before delving into the world of youth club soccer. As the Hoopheads podcast audience grows week by week, Your five-star ratings and reviews help fuel our growth. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or our new YouTube channel. When you do, the latest episodes will hit your phone as soon as they drop. If you are a coach at any level, in any sport, or the parent of an athlete, you'll find tremendous value in this episode as we talk with John O'Sullivan from the Changing the Game Project. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel today. He is actually at his middle school basketball game that had been canceled yesterday. So hopefully Coach Jason's going to bring home a victory. Tonight uh, we are here and pleased to welcome to the podcast John O'Sullivan from the Changing the Game Project. John, welcome. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited to get a chance to have you on the show, talk to you a little bit about your own background and then all the great things that you have going with the Change in the Game Project, which are all things that we wholeheartedly support here at the Hoop Heads Podcast and at my basketball company, Head Start Basketball. So, John, let's start out by talking a little bit about your background. Can you tell people uh, kind of what you did as a kid, as an athlete, 
and talk a little about what your experiences were like as a young player. Sure. So I'm 47. So I grew up uh, in New York on Long Island um, where everyone my age, you know, we played soccer in the fall and we played basketball and we were wrestlers and we played baseball and I think I played some golf and, you know, I, I kind of did as much fishing as possible too, I think as a kid. Um, but just, you know, a very typical sort of multi-sport um, experience uh, growing up. And then as I got older and got into high school, I went to a big Catholic school called St. Anthony's High School. And I remember going to soccer tryouts and looking around and there was like a hundred freshmen for seven spots. And I'm thinking, whew, I don't know <laughs> if I can do this for both baseball and soccer. And I really like soccer. So I kind of just went down the soccer path and, um, you know, we had, you know, some phenomenal players and a great group there. And, you know, follow that path, played division one college at Fordham University, uh, played professionally for a little while after I had a couple of injuries that finished me um, early in the process and then just got into coaching. I really wanted to still be around the game and I, I got an opportunity to be a very young varsity high school coach in Raleigh, North Carolina, followed by a, a college job at the University of Vermont and kind of been involved in coaching ever since. Did you know when you were a kid that you always wanted to be a coach or is that something that happened sort of as your playing career was winding down and you started looking for ways to stay in the game or did you know when you were let's say a middle school or high school athlete that you wanted to get into coaching possibly? Definitely not. I I mean I think I I coached, you know, because the opportunity presented itself, but I never looked at it as like, oh, this is what I'll be doing for the next 20 years or 30 years. Um, but I didn't really know what else I wanted to do. All right. I finished, uh, I finished college and took the LSATs. I'm like, well, may I'll just go to law school and, uh, took uh, a little bit of time off, um, from playing at that point and moved to Vail, Colorado, skied for a winter. And I'm like, why would I go to law school if I can do stuff like ski in Vail all winter? Yeah, there you go. That sounds uh, pretty know. good, John. And that was when um, one of my high school teachers became a principal uh, down in Raleigh. And he said, hey, um, I need a varsity soccer coach. Are you interested? And I hadn't really considered it at that point. Um, but I said, sure, you know, why not? Um, that's something different. And uh, so I took that opportunity to, to do that. That led back to me playing again for a while with a pro team in North Carolina. And um yeah, I did that for a couple of years and then, you know, I still love skiing and I'm like, huh, how can I do both? And that's when this job opened up at University of Vermont. I'm like, oh, wow, I can coach and ski. That still seems better than law school. And that's what I did. <laughs> nice. And when you can combine all your passions into one life, that's pretty good. Well, it's cool, too, because, you know, working in a college environment, you're really around you know, other coaches. And so you get to learn from them. And, you know, when I worked at UVM, there was a basketball coach there named Tom Brennan. Um, and they, they really had a good run at that point and made a couple NCAA tournaments. And, um, you know, I just got to see his interaction with the players and the staff and how he surrounded himself with coaches that, you know, were maybe good at things that weren't his strong suit. And I learned a lot about coaching, just kind of sitting on the side, watching him and watching they had an excellent ice hockey coach there as well. And, uh, just sort of being an observer, it, really learning that there was a lot more to coaching than, uh, how many activities and drills and practice plans I had. Yeah. I think there's a great deal to be said there for learning from other coaches. And I think that's one thing that sometimes, especially learning from coaches in other sports, there's a lot of times that coaches might go and observe a coach in their own sport, but it's not often that you see that sort of cross pollination between, coaches from one sport going and observing coaches in another sport. So if you had to think about that time, what were some of the things, can you think of one or two things specifically that you learned from some of those other coaches at the university of Vermont that weren't coaching soccer, but that you were able to pick up that made you a better coach? Um, yeah, you know, certainly with, with Tom Brennan and I don't know if, you know, followers of your podcast, I don't know if Tom still is on ESPN and, doing all his commentary work that he's done since he retired, but just sort of this idea of, 
you know, there was more to life than basketball um, and and things like that. And we want to compete and we want to be really good. But at the same time, uh, th- there's more to life to that. And, and then, you know, the hockey coach was this guy, Mike Gilligan. And, you know, he went on and became a national team assistant coach on the women's side. And, um, you know, it, it was a tough time when he was there because they had had some great success and maybe they were in a bit of a down period and just watching the guy, you know, how how does someone, you know, open the papers every morning and read about how horrible he is and, and still show up every day and do your job and, and, and stick to your principles of, you know, I'm doing the right thing here. I know we're on the right path. And so to, you know, just, just kind of very different. And I think you make a great point of when, when you, when you learn or you're mentored by, or you're in some sort of coaching mastermind with people who are outside of your sport, it takes a lot of the ego out of the room, right? Like you're the hockey guy, you're the basketball guy, I'm the soccer guy. Let's meet in the middle and talk about coaching versus feeling like, oh, I don't want to speak up because clearly this guy knows a lot more about basketball than I do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think you do take that ego out of the equation. And the other thing that I think is interesting and it's, it's I think, more prevalent today than it's ever been is there's now more opportunities for coaches, again, cross sports, but also within the sport as well, to be able to connect with people all over the country just in the way that we're connecting you know, via Skype tonight. It's just before, if you go back to the time of you know, whatever, let's say 1990, you basically, if you wanted to have a conversation with other coaches, you were having conversations with coaches in your geographic area. And a lot of times coaches don't necessarily want to share their the tools of their trade with somebody that they might have to compete against on a Friday Friday night or Saturday afternoon. Whereas now, if I'm a coach in any sport, I could connect with, you know, I'm here in Ohio, I can connect with you in Oregon or somebody in Texas or, you know, somebody in New York and never have to worry about setting foot on the playing field against them and still have that kind of interaction like what you're talking about. I totally agree. And I think you're – realistically, if you're a coach today, there's no excuse for not listening to podcasts or reading books or being part of a WhatsApp group or a Slack group or a Facebook page or whatever it is to make yourself better. Um, You know, when I meet coaches who, you know, uh, you know, I've been doing it this way 25 years, I'm not changing like that scares me. I don't want those people around my own kids. Um, I mean, thank God, you know, that's not the doctor you want in the ER when you have a heart attack, you know, you want someone who's like, Hey, there's new and better ways to do this. And certainly in, in every sport, what we've learned in psychology and through fMRIs and, and now, you know, in motor learning and skill acquisition and all these sort of things, the idea that you're going to coach the same way for the last 30 years and, and think that you're, you're, you're doing the best. I, I mean, most people point to John Wooden as maybe the best coach in any sport of all time. And yet, if you know anything about John Wooden, he was a very different coach in the beginning of his career when most of his players were former soldiers returning from war than he was at the end of his career coaching the Bill Waltons and the Lou Alcinders of the world. Yeah, I think evolving as a coach is definitely key to success. You make a great point, too, about just – the amount of available resources for coaches today is just incredible. I mean, if you want to find out a, from an, let's just say X's and O's standpoint, whatever sport you're talking about, obviously that information is super easy to come by. You can just do a Google search and find anything that you would possibly want. And then if we go to maybe some of the softer skills, uh, if we start talking about culture or leadership and those kinds of things, just, I found, and I'm sure you found the same thing that people, again, whether it's across the country or across the world, are so willing to share what they've learned that there's just no excuse for somebody not getting out there and improving themselves as a coach. Exactly. And again, if you can, you know, spell the word Google, you can find practice plans up the yin yang, you know, and so it's really then about, um, learning about and uh, you know I, I don't love the word softer skills because I think the connection and the communication is is you know that's that's the recipe that ties it all together um, and and without it it doesn't matter what you know and so um, I think 
we do coaches a disservice when we do coaching education and all we do is hand them sessions or some PDF that has um, the same stuff that I could email to them instead of taking the time to talk to them about, you know, what do the kids that of the age and stage that you're coaching, what do they need from you? Um, and what do they want out of this experience? That's really what we should be teaching in coaching 101, not the sports science stuff that we really like to teach. So let's take it that direction in terms of coach education. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as some of the challenges to improving coach education here in the United States? Because I know that's one of the things that I've heard you talk about on the Way of Champions podcast and I've read on your blog, just the need for coach education, how oftentimes there's resistance from organizations. So can you talk a little bit about that and what you see as the challenges and how we overcome that as a, uh, you know, a sports country. Sure. And I think it's certainly probably not just basketball, but across most sports, most people's early intro to a sport comes with a volunteer coach, right? So it's a mom or a dad that either knows something about the sport or doesn't. Um, and they forgot to, uh, you know, take their name out of the hat. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, guess what? Everyone else said no and you didn't respond. So you're the coach of this team. Right. And, and what we know statistically is that when kids are coached by a trained coach, the, the dropout rate drops, you know, from about, you know, kids who play for an untrained coach about 20, I think it's 20 to 30 percent of them don't come back next year. Whereas when they play for a trained coach, um, it, that drops to under 10%. So we keep more kids in the game when we train our coaches. Now, I think too many organizations who are especially who are relying on volunteers um, say, you know, they look at the least motiv motivated volunteer and say, well, look, you know, no one wants to do this stuff because look at them like, you know, we're already asking too much. And what I would say, like, thank God we don't say that about our volunteer firefighters, right? Like <laughs> we train them and they volunteer and they show up every month to get better at what they're doing because we're pouring into them. It becomes more enjoyable. And so, so many organizations never get past go because they have a couple of unmotivated people who complain about having to go to training when in fact, most of their coaches are open to it and if you create opportunities for more learning and more learning and more learning, people will come back. And those are the coaches who kind of stick around after their kid ages out because you've taught them to coach well. So then they love coaching. And this is, I think, the biggest mistake that we make. And there's no other area in our child's or kids' lives where we, you know, put them in such an impactful situation that could potentially be dangerous from a physical, psychological, emotional standpoint, and then put them with people who have no training and wash our hands of it. And I think it's really, really sad. And some of the organizations that we've had a lot of success working with who have poured more into coaching education, there it's not actually harder for them to find coaches. It's actually become easier for them to find coaches. And this is the big myth that we have to kind of convince people of. So how do we do that? How do we reach out? I mean, besides some of the things that you're doing, some of the things that we're trying to do here, just spreading the word and making sure people understand, is there any uh, magic formula? Is there any way to, to continue to, to educate or is it just a kind of a drip by drip thing that has to happen slowly over time, you think? Sure. I mean, I think what you do is you say, hey, this is 1.0 that everyone has to go through. And then next month we offer this and next month we offer this. And every week I'm going to send you an email with a great practice plan or a good podcast or a good blog. And so we drip feed you good information. And yeah, not everyone's going to, you know, read it all, but some people will. And those are the ones I think are, you know, sometimes we get so turned off by the discouraged ones that we don't pay any attention to the people who do everything we ask and then want more. And so I think that's where it starts is is pay attention to your bright spots and give them more and more information, um, because if you do that, that's when good things happen. And and that's when those kids have a better experience and that's when those coaches have a better experience. So I think organizations have to say to their volunteers, look, 
we so appreciate you being here and we understand that you're giving a lot of your time and we're going to ask you just to give a little bit more so that you can be a better coach because even if you played it doesn't mean you understand coaching right just because you know it doesn't mean you can transmit it to others um and in return for you doing that we have your back we are going to be present at your games when we hear parents getting out of line we will step in and make them be quiet we will support the officials we will support you as a coach we have your back but in order for us to have your back you have to go through this and again the organizations that are doing that are having better coach retention better coach training and and therefore better outcomes and experiences for their kids so let's jump on top of that and throw in educating parents about the need for all those things that you just described for coaches i think one of the things that sometimes is frustrating for people who are coaching and doing things the right way is that parents sometimes look at unfortunately the outcome as opposed to the process and so they see one coach that's winning or one organization that's winning and they don't really look at the experience that their child is having and so I think and let me know if you agree I think part of it is educating parents on what types of things they should be looking for in a coach and in an organization Oh, 100 percent. It It is imperative that organizations provide their parents with more than just some, you know, code of conduct that they sign and then no one ever pays attention to the piece of paper again and say, hey, we're going to help you out. But therefore, you are then accountable for this. So the most successful organizations that we work with will usually bring in one of our speakers and we'll do something live. But then we have an online little one hour thing that is covers basically the same material and so we say to them look people you know parents should either show up to this or they spend the hour online and they print out the certificate and they hand that in and then you hold them accountable for it but the problem is as soon as you don't hold people accountable you know as soon as that dad starts screaming at the ref or you know coach put in my kid the parents start looking around and say, are they going to be serious about this or not? And if no one confronts that behavior and says, that's not how we do things here, then guess what? You've just condoned it and and you've just given everyone else carte blanche to act that way as well. But if you confront it immediately and say, this is not how we're doing things here anymore. That's not how our parents are going to ask. I don't care what they're doing on the other side of the court there. This is how we're going to be. This is how we're going to behave. We, we are teaching more than basketball or soccer or hockey. We're teaching life skills. And so we have to model this behavior. And I think when you do that, um, that tells parents like, okay, this is different. And I think parents are, are craving that experience. They're not, I, I don't know a lot of parents who love the super expensive, high commitment, high stress and pressure for nine-year-old thing. I mean, I just shared something on Twitter the other day. I know you're a basketball guy. Um, I mean, AAU running a seven and under national championship. I mean, that's a joke. Yeah, it's there's, there's a lot of that. I mean, basketball, I think probably more than a lot of other sports goes down pretty young in terms. Of, I had a conversation with somebody that, you know, I'll see things where they'll be advertised where they'll have like a college showcase for grades three through eight. And we've had a couple college coaches on there. And, you know, I laugh and ask them, I said, have you, how many of those third grade exposure events have you been out to check out the, you know, the eight year old basketball players? And of course, you know, we know what their answer is. They're, yeah. they're not checking that out. But yet when parent A talks to parent B and parent B says, yeah, my kid's going to there, you know, going there and he's getting this and we're going to do this and play on this team. And people feel that, that peer pressure to to get involved. And I think if you really take the time to talk to parents and you get them away from sort of that crowd mentality and you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, almost everybody universally feels the same way that a lot of what we do with our kids is too much. And it kind of goes back to, uh, you know, I found it interesting. You and I are about the same age, um, 48. And, you know, I think probably our experiences growing up were similar in that I played lots and lots of sports. My mom and dad didn't drive me to those sports. I played them in my backyard. I played them in the neighborhood. I played them down, you know, behind the tree and this and, you know, went and 
went in the creek to catch frogs and do things like that. And, you know, today kids don't play that same way. They just, they just don't. We take them everywhere. And I think parents all feel that stress level and they just feel pressure from other people to be able to kind of keep up with the Joneses. And, but when you really talk to them, everybody kind of wants to get off that treadmill. And so it's just a matter of, like I said, I think educating people that there is another option. Yeah. No one wants to get off at first because that's when it's scary, right? You get off and then you notice that no one else did. And then you feel like your son or your daughter is falling behind when, if we can give everyone an excuse to get off, um, then good things happen. And this is where I think sport governing bodies can come in and really make a difference. And, you know, a great example would be soccer or ice hockey or um, lacrosse, where there's a national mandate for small sided games or cross ice hockey, right? That you are not allowed to play full ice hockey if you're a USA hockey member anymore. And um, the, the great thing about that is it takes that pressure of a club being the first because, hey, all the evidence and all the research says that this is better for the kids, but it's still scary because people think it's not real hockey. Well, now 10 years later, they have much better retention rates and much more skillful and better players because they went cross ice, they got rid of body checking and they got rid of national championships and stuff like that for young kids because they didn't benefit the kids. And so this is where I think, you know, a, you know, an, an NBA should can step in. And I know they're trying to do some stuff, but how do you get people on board? Because, again, you've got AAU, a huge organization still running seven-year-old national championships. And really that's all about just exploiting kids and making money. That's not about, you know, oh, this is, this is, is making them better basketball players. No chance. Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, it's just, I think one of the things that at least on the basketball side of it, there's, there's so many private businesses, clubs, organizations that are, making a living off of kids that it's very difficult to be able to make inroads into the system. And I know USA basketball and the NBA through their junior NBA program are definitely working in that direction, but there's just so many different factions that are out there that again, have a financial interest in keeping the system the way it is. I've made the argument with people all the time. And I know you've said it in terms of soccer and hockey that, you know, to have, kids who are eight, nine years old playing on the adult dimensions of the court or the field and, you know, with the same number of players is just, it's crazy. In basketball, I've told people I could make, I could make a pretty convincing argument that if we played nothing but three on three basketball on a lower basket with a smaller ball up until seventh grade, that we'd end up with players that were far more skilled as we transitioned them into five on five. And I think just by Again, the evidence shows, the research shows, the number of touches you get on the ball or the puck or whatever the case might be just increases your opportunity to make decisions, especially in a decision-making sport like soccer or hockey or basketball, where you can't just do that block practice. You have to be able to make decisions within the framework of the game. Those small-sided games just make a huge difference in the development of players. Exactly. I, I could not agree more. In a dynamic sport, it's not just about touches; it's about interactions, it's about decisions. And you know, I had, you know, when a couple of years ago, my daughter played a, a season of basketball, and it was always really interesting. So, probably at that time, she was in fifth grade. Um, girls, many of whom it was their first year or so, and the practice right before them was like some third grade boys, and so they had the lower hoops hanging off the regular baskets and the girls would show up and they're they'd be shooting on these lower hoops with good shooting form right with 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 good technique because they could reach the basket and then people would okay time to take these baskets down and play on the quote real ones and then you see the kids all of a sudden the you know one-handed shot is is gone they're they're heaving it up throwing air balls because they're not strong enough to, to shoot on a, a 10 foot basket. And I'm saying, where are the people looking at this saying, oh, this is a good thing for these kids, right? So sometimes I think we even have to 
be careful about just making it broad based on a calendar and saying developmentally, when are people ready for this basket? Well, when they're tall enough and strong enough to throw this size ball this, you know, this far with this technique, then they should be playing on it and not a second before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grew up, my dad, thankfully, my dad was an exercise physiologist. And so he maybe was a little bit ahead of his time in terms of some of those things. So I grew up playing on a much lower basket than everybody else, uh, you know, and slowly, incrementally, it got raised as I got older. And I still am a huge proponent of that. I tell people, you know, all the time when they ask about my, you know, opinion about, well, should the kids be shooting on a 10 foot basket or, you know, an eight foot basket at whatever age? And I'll just say, well, you know, how does your kid compare to LeBron? You know, LeBron plays on a 10 foot basket. I'm guessing he's a little bit bigger and stronger than your kid. So your kid could probably benefit from shooting on a lower basket to your point, shooting the ball correctly, learning how to do it with good form so that eventually when they do grow and they do mature and they are ready for more and they are ready to play on a 10 foot basket, they now have the fundamental skill that's required to be able to do it successfully as opposed to, you know, again, shucking up shots from their waist and across their body and using, you know, using terrible technique. It just, it just doesn't make sense on any level. No, no. And that's why I always ask people, you know, why do you, if they argue against that, why do you believe that? Right. Because that's how the pros play. I mean, that's a terrible argument, right? Then why don't we just put giant desks and chairs in the kindergarten classroom and teach them calculus? Right. I mean, that's how the adults do math. Right. But no, that doesn't make sense. And so, again, we need to create versions of the game that fit the learner, not fit the adults who are running it. And this is where I think our biggest disconnect in sports. And there's a huge movement to change this with, you know, across all sports and the USOC's American development model, um, you know, trying to contextualize ages and stages of appropriate sport based on the needs of the learner and not the needs of uh, the coach or the parents. And let's take it down to a very base level and talk about why sports needs to be fun as opposed to being something that is there for the benefit of the adult coach to show, show how smart he or she is. Well, I think, I mean, one of the biggest misconceptions is this idea that sports can either be, you know, I like to use the word enjoyment, maybe more than fun, you know, but fun or competitive. But yet when you talk to, you know, the, the number one core value of the best basketball team in the world, the Golden State Warriors, is joy. They talk about joy all the time. You got to love what you're doing. You got to have fun here. That's why the music's blaring. We're laughing and smiling and keeping it real. And so if the Golden State Warriors can be about joy, certainly your 10-year-old, your 12-year-old, your 14-year-old, your 16-year-old team should be about joy, enjoyment as well. Because when you ask athletes, regardless of age, why they're there, enjoyment is always one of the top answers, if not number one. Now, a, an 18-year-old high school senior might define it, define enjoyment or fun differently than an eight-year-old, but they still use the same word. And so it's up to us as coaches to understand what makes this fun, what's going to get them coming back, uh, because if we ignore that, then kids are just going to walk away when we're chasing after, oh, well, we, you know, we got to do all this stuff so that we're ready to play, and I don't care what the kids want out of this, well... You know, good luck with that. How's that working for you? Yeah, absolutely. Can you clarify the difference in your mind between enjoyment and fun? Because I know I've heard you talk about that before. And can you just clarify the difference between those two terms? Well, I think, first of all, it might just be semantics. You know, when I use the word enjoyment, um, I really differentiate it from the word pleasure. And those are two different things, right? So enjoyment is, you know, the pursuit of your long-term goals, showing up, trying to get better at something. Um, it can be hard. It can be demanding. It can be a struggle. But you still want to say, man, I want to do that again, as opposed to pleasure, which is, you know, in the moment I ate a tub of ice cream. And as soon as it's over, eh, that wasn't such a great idea. And so, and so that's the difference. I think the word fun is just a word – that, you know, an adult might say enjoyment and a, and a, a younger kid might say fun. But I, I think they're, they're very similar. Now, 
when we ask kids, you know, this woman named Amanda Visick from George Washington University has done a ton of research on how kids from age eight to 18 define fun. And, and they came up with 81 characteristics. Now, I ask coaches a lot. Well, when you hear the word fun and kids say it, what do you think they mean? And they say, oh, well, you know, fooling around and not paying attention and playing silly games and stuff. But actually, when you ask kids, that's not fun. Fun is uh, being respected and encouraged, trying hard, getting playing time in games, um, you know, great team dynamics, positive coaching. Um, that's what fun is. And and we're capable as coaches of creating fun because we can coach positively and we can pay attention to team dynamics and we can make our environment, you know, challenging and, and, and where they work hard. I mean, I've never met a kid who says, God, I hope we stand in line a lot today. Right. And, and this is this is our challenge of like, you know, if we have lines and laps and, and lots of lectures, it's not going to be fun. It's not a very effective practice either, no matter what you think. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Alan Stein, Jr. Hello, Hoopheads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer in Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, and discover why you should attend a Head Start Basketball camp this summer. Hope to see you there. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I always find to be interesting, and I sort of take it for granted as someone I have a I teach for my day job and then obviously I've been running a basketball camp and working with young kids for a long, long time and you're sort of in that same position and you take it for granted the ability to organize or create a, a drill or an activity that incorporates everybody and has everybody with a ball and has everybody active and moving and a lot of times you'll see you know, a more inexperienced coach that will do something that could easily be broken up into three or four groups and instead there's one group with a couple kids doing something and the other kids just standing and watching. And I think that to go back to what we talked about earlier, when we provide quality coach education that talks about, you know, again, how to organize a practice plan and what drills should look like and not even giving them specific drills, but just the idea that you want to have as many kids as engaged as you possibly can in every activity that you do, that goes a long way toward making the practice fun or enjoyable as opposed to one or two kids are out on the floor or the field doing something and the rest of the kids are just standing around watching them. Exactly. And I mean, this is great coaching in a nutshell, right? Is, is those kids should not be standing around. They should not be, um, uh, you know, listening to lectures all the time after the first 20 seconds they're not listening anymore anyway right and so i i think um our challenge as coaches is to create that environment now i think certainly without a doubt 12 and under and and i'd say you can go a little farther on this as well um for me that environment 
in a game like basketball is a whole part, whole practice, right? So show up and let them start playing, right? Play from the beginning. Play three. You know, you got 12 kids on your team. Play cross court, you know, 3v3 for the first, you know, 15 minutes. Why not? Because the kids are playing, they'll show up early if they get to play first. They're getting out the sugar that their parents gave them in the car, <laughs> you know, yep. and, and it deals with the reality of the fact that not everyone's there on time. So if you try to start with some complex, you know, activity um, and kids are showing up late, what are you constantly doing? Explaining to the next kid and the next kid and the next kid what we're doing versus here's a penny, jump in there. Now it's a 3v3. Right. And so play for 15 minutes. You can start coaching what you're going to do in that practice. Right. And then you break it down and you do an activity and then you play again at the end. But if you're not playing the game, you know, minimum, you know, two thirds to three quarters of your practice with young kids in a dynamic sport like basketball, you are not doing them any favors because, uh, again, what transfers in basketball is not block practice. What transfers is is context, right? It's seeing a situation and then having the technical ability to make a decision and execute that. Now, we want to send them home and say, go shoot, you know, 300 shots and I'll see you on Thursday. Take two balls and work on your dribbling. But if I get two practices a week or three practices a week, that's got to be dynamic, team-based you know, constraints led practice that looks like the game, because if it doesn't look like the game, it's not going to plug into the game on Saturday. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Two things there. One is I know that from the time that I started coaching when I was young, right out of college, that I probably would have thought more the other way that real coaching involved setting them up in drills and lines and doing repeated things over and over again. And that felt like coaching at that time. So it's definitely one of the ways that I've evolved as a coach and certainly the way that coaching has evolved. And then I think the second piece of that is sometimes there's some coach ego involved that by just, quote, letting them play, that I'm not coaching. And so if parents are there watching my practice and they just see me standing on the side and maybe I'm just occasionally interjecting a one or two you know word comment to people, uh, that may not be perceived as coaching. And then the coach starts going, well, these parents don't think I'm doing a good job because I'm not running the typical old school lines, drills, practice. So I think those are, you know, that's something that I think sometimes meets with resistance with coaches when they don't want to evolve and change into the, you know, the way that you just described, which is obviously more effective. Exactly. And and again, this is where as coaches, we have to have the confidence and the courage to educate our parents of there's a reason why we're doing it this way. And it's not because I'm lazy. Right. And and again, if you're just letting them play and you're on your phone texting, yeah, you're not coaching. Right. But but letting the game happen and coaching over the top of the game and asking a, a kid, hey, what'd you see out there in that situation or why'd you make that decision? That's coaching. Right. And then depending on their ability, you can break it down into, you know what, we're, we're not, you know, in this moment good enough to do this. We're not going to get enough shots off if we're playing three against three. So it might have to be three against one in the beginning. Right. So that we're creating more shots and we're getting more repetitions of that. But to make it three against zero that doesn't make any sense because there's no defender. So therefore there's no decision. Um, so therefore all the cues that tell me in this moment, I should pass or I should shoot, or I should, you know, um, you know, take a jump shot versus drive the hoop. They're all gone. Right. And if I remove all the cues, then when I play the game on Saturday and all the cues pop up that tell me what to do, I've never seen them before. So all that great, you know, three on zero work um, doesn't it does. There's no transfer. It doesn't translate to the game. And and there's more and more science showing this. Um, the research is very clear on it. The the motor learning people are are very much unanimous on this is how people learn in dynamic situations. 
And therefore, that's what our practices should mostly consist of. It doesn't mean that there's not time to, you know, show a kid, you know, the exact technique of a bounce pass or where their elbow needs to be on a shot or what foot to take off on a layup. Of course there is. But the idea that you're going to spend half to two thirds of every single practice with no defenders, no direction and no decisions and think that you're coaching effectively, you know, you just can't back that up with anything except your own opinion. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's two things that I pull out of that. One is I think that the need to coach using questions as opposed to statements, I think is a real key to being an effective coach in, you know, in the sporting world today, especially with young kids. You know, I heard you say, as you were describing that practice scenario, you know, why did you do that? Why did you make the decision here to pass instead of shoot? Or why did you make the decision to dribble left instead of right? And I think when you ask kids the question, as opposed to you just telling them, you know, it's just like any other research, whether it's, you know, teaching in the classroom or teaching through coaching, that kids are going to learn more when they come up with those answers on their own, as opposed to somebody spoon feeding them. Uh, and then the second part that uh, I pulled out of what you said is, and it goes to with our players, I think it goes with parents, I think it goes along with just about anybody that you'd be trying to work with is explaining the why of what you're doing things, uh, why you're doing things. Because a lot of times, if you explain the why, then people are much more likely to get on board as opposed to your point, if they see you over on the side and you know, you're not running those drills, they may not understand what you're doing, but if you can give them the why behind it, then you've bolstered your case for doing something that's appropriate for the kids on your team. Exactly. And and I think the way you give people the why is you sort of start at the end. What would you like – what are the qualities of a basketball – of a bas- that you'd like your son or your daughter to have when they're 18, right? And and then let's work back from there. Bec- and, and, you know – at first, people will be thinking, you know, oh, well, great jump shot or quick feed or great pass or whatever that is. But but realistically, the game is constantly changing. Right. Look at professional basketball now and the need for three point shooters compared to 10 years ago. It's a yeah, whole absolutely. different game. It's, a, at, it's at like that, a totally it's a totally different game. It's now. a totally different game uh, at at that level because the game evolved. Right. And so. You know, in I had uh, these guests on my on the Way Champions podcast a couple weeks back. And these guys worked in English rugby, and this is now permeated into other sports throughout rugby, but then in other sports in England. Um, and they call it uh, cards, and the acronym cards stands for creativity, awareness, resilience, decision making, self organization. So. Those are five qualities that we want our professional athletes, our college athletes, our high school athletes to have. We want them to be creative. We want them to, you know, be thoughtful and thinkers and pay attention to what's going on. We want them to be resilient in the face of adversity. We need them to be on the on the fly problem solvers and decision makers. And we want them to be able to solve those problems on their own and, and self-organize. So if those are high quality If those are what we would call, you know, transferable qualities that we want in every athlete, because regardless of how the game evolves, if you possess those qualities, you are prepared to evolve with it. Right. So if we want that at 18 or 22, then where is that when they're eight and 10? Because that's when we need to start building it in. And that doesn't happen in an environment where kids don't get asked questions, where they're not made to think about it, where they're not made to make decisions. Um, And and so this is our challenge in coaching. Um, The qualities that we want to see down the line are the qualities that we have to start teaching and incorporating in our practice today. So I always challenge coaches like if you believe that these are the qualities of the ideal soccer player or ideal basketball player or ideal hockey player or rugby player, whatever it is. Where is that in your practice today? Because if it's not in there, <laughs> then you're missing out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think basketball, especially today, kids just don't play basketball the way that I grew up playing it or the way that you grew up playing it. And I think a lot of the creativity and decision-making skills and the ability to self-organize and all the things you described there and that CARDS acronym are things that 
I'm not sure I developed those under the tutelage of any coach necessarily. I think I developed those skills by playing games in my neighborhood when I was really young and then by going to the playground when I was in middle school and high school and figuring out how to get myself on the court and win games and stay on and get picked up for the next game and all those kinds of things. And so we've talked to a bunch of high school basketball coaches and they say that 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 creativity and decision-making skills and ability to self-organize are definitely things that are lacking in today's players, maybe especially guys who have coached for a long time, that they saw more of that you know, 15, 20 years ago. And as the, as the playground culture has gone away and the AAU and constantly organized culture has come in, you see less creative players because they're always playing under the watchful eye of a coach and they don't just get to experiment on the driveway or in the playground. And so I think that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. But to your point, in today's world, you have to be able to give kids the opportunity to do those things or how can you ever expect them to do it on their own? Exactly. And so this is our challenge as coaches. Can we create that space because it's what the learner, the child in front of me needs and it's what they want, right? It makes it more enjoyable because honestly, in any practice, if, you know, if a kid commits, right, 100 percent, you know, makes a decision and with full effort and full focus, try something and they fail, you can't be mad at them. Right. You can't be mad. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you you have to say, again, what would you see there in hindsight? What might you do differently since that didn't work out? But but, you know, you see coaches, you know, screaming at kids for playing the wrong pass or taking a shot when they thought they should pass it. Well, you you know, you find me a basketball player who is afraid to shoot and I'll find you a kid who's been yelled at for missing. Yeah, no question about that. That goes to something that I know you've written about recently, and that's the difference between uh, coaches who are demanding and demeaning or coaches who can be abusive. And so can you talk a little bit about how important it is to the psyche of a young athlete to have the type of coach that's going to nurture them in a positive way through the sporting environment? Sure. I mean, I think that's that's the absolute key, that when – as an athlete, if I know that my coach believes in me and is in it for me, I am far more likely to work harder, to take more chances, to go home and work on my own and, and to fall in love with this because I own it and I enjoy it. And therefore, I develop intrinsic motivation to go do it more. And when I do it enough, then I develop mastery. Um, and so this is where I think it starts with coaches understanding that. You know, they don't care how much, you know, till they know how much you care. And and so you've got to be building those connections so that your players know that you care. And that's as simple as, you know, one we call Jerry and I call it the rule of one. Right. One person, one comment, one time. Catch them being good. It might stick with a kid the rest of their life. Um, You know, being uh, attuned and, and seeing them. When they're struggling, pulling them aside and say, hey, you know what? I see that, you know, do you remember the the video of I think it was last season or two seasons ago of of Steve Kerr pulling aside Steph Curry when he was in a big shooting slump? And Steve Kerr pointed out to him when you're on the court, we're plus whatever. And when you're doing this plus whatever. So I know your shots not falling, but you're still making a difference. And he says, carry on, my son. Absolutely. You know, know, and that is telling a player I see you. And Steph Curry, arguably, you know, one of the top five players in the world needs that. So why would you think a 12 year old doesn't need it? Yeah, I think sometimes we get caught up as youth coaches and and coaches of any level. You kind of sometimes forget about the individual person that's inside of your players and you, you look at your team as a whole. And so I think for coaches out there, it's really important to make sure that you understand that you're coaching the person and not just the athlete. And so we've spent some time tonight talking about how we make our athletes better, but I think it's really important to your point to make sure that we're coaching that human being that's inside of the uniform. I I couldn't agree with that more because ultimately the, the vast majority of your players are not playing pro, <laughs> they're probably not playing college, maybe they're playing high school, right? So so 
you know, this idea that, well, all I'm doing is developing the athlete, it, it doesn't make any sense. And and again, when you coach the person and not the sport, when you pour into them as a person, it doesn't make you less competitive. It doesn't make a worse learning environment. It, it makes a better one. Right. Like, no, no. If I ask people, name your favorite teacher, it's not someone who disrespected you and made you afraid and and, you know, whatever. It's probably someone that you knew was in it for you and they were demanding and they didn't let you do any less than your best. But you knew they cared about you and they believed in you and maybe they saw something in you then that you didn't see in yourself. And that goes for your favorite coach as well. And and so. I always encourage coaches, think about the best coach you ever had. Know that he or she is in you. Look at what those qualities are and and start asking yourself, are my kids having the same experience, right? What does it feel like to be coached by me? And if they're not, then you need to change. Yeah, I agree. I think that a lot of times we tend to think about the really good coaches as being, you know, these technical experts. But to your point, when you think about the people that you remember, whether that's a teacher or a coach, you tend to remember the relationship side of those people much more than you remember the technical X's and O's side. And I think that's one of the things that as a coach, as, as I've matured and evolved, I've done a much better job of working with the individuals. And right now I'm coaching just my own kids at various levels of, of basketball And I've found that by doing team building activities and we'll put together a team notebook and have the kids share and talk about some of the life lessons and things that we've talked about tonight, by getting them to open up and share and connect with both you and with their teammates, you just create an environment that's so much more fun that the kids enjoy. And when you do that, you get more out of them. And by getting more out of them doesn't necessarily translate to the outcome on the scoreboard. It may but it doesn't necessarily have to. But what you see is that you're maximizing them as both people and as athletes by by focusing on those life lessons that you teach as opposed to just the technical skills of the sport. Yeah, and this is what you know Joe Ehrman in his book Inside Out Coaching would call transformational coaching versus transactional coaching, right? Transactional is you sign up, you pay me, I teach basketball. And transformational is I develop the person, which helps me develop the athlete and I develop the team. And then, you know, I come forth. What, what's what's in it for me comes forth. And and I think there's too many examples of transactional coaching out there. Some of it's intentional, some of it's not intentional. And and sport can be this amazing vehicle for, for transforming lives. Uh, one of the other things, you know, Joe talks about is um, this idea that, you know, the, this myth that sport develops character and, you know, there's two types of character, right? There, there's moral character and there's performance character. So certainly being in a demanding basketball environment might develop some of that performance character, like grit and resilience and stuff like that. Um, but what we would call moral character, respect, integrity, compassion, things like that, that only happens when a coach is very intentional about weaving that into his or her lessons and modeling that type of behavior. And so sometimes, you know, we say, oh, well, sport develops character. Not really. Not unless you're doing it on purpose. Yeah, I think being intentional with those kinds of things is the key. If you don't do it intentionally, then more than likely it's not going to happen. It's not going to be a piece of what you're trying to accomplish. So, John, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about changing the game project before we get out of here today. Can you talk about sort of the genesis of how you came up with the idea and where it got started and then just share some of the great things that you're doing with it today? Yeah, well, thanks for that opportunity. I mean, changing the game project started, you know, about six years ago now as sort of an idea of wanting to write a book and help parents and coaches understand that, you know, state of mind is the greatest influencer on performance. And we as the adults have great control over the state of mind of our athletes by the environment that we create, the way we communicate, how we give them ownership, how we how confidence develops, you know, all you know, and how we show caring and unconditional love. So I wrote a book, realized it's actually not that hard to write a book, but it's 
kind of hard to sell it. And so I started, (laughs) you know, I started a blog around it. Uh, The blog became pretty popular because again, there was sort of this area that I think a lot of coaches and parents were, were feeling that sports was going down the wrong path. And so we were able to reach a lot of people. It morphed into a Ted talk on, you know, youth sports um, and now a podcast called way of champions. And so, yeah, six years later, I mean, we have this blog, we have this podcast, big, social media followings on all the different platforms. And I mean, really, we just provide tons and tons of free content for anyone who wants to be a better parent, a better coach, a better administrator. And then we also do workshops and online courses and things like that for people who, you know, want to bring us in and partner with us to educate their coaches or their parents or their student athletes and things like that. So, I mean, I just got back from, 19 days of speaking in England, Ireland, and Spain. Um, I mean, last year I was in Australia, I was in Thailand, you know, we're all over the world delivering these type of workshops. Um, and of course, you know, in our own backyard, trying to make uh, my own kids sporting experience a good one as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know that I've spent a lot of time, you know, looking at your content I've shared on my blog on headstartbasketball.com. I've shared tons and tons of your articles because I just think that everything that you write has been spot on and, and dovetails almost perfectly with the thoughts and beliefs that I have. And although a lot of times the articles may not be directly specific to basketball, I find that they're super applicable to just about any youth sports situation in a lot of cases. Of all the things that you're doing with the changing the game project is there one particular thing like whether it's the writing or the podcast or the speaking is there one that stands out that you like better than the others or or are you equally as uh, excited when you get an opportunity to do any of them you know I'm 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 excited by all of them I, I would certainly say I mean we're coming into about our hundredth podcast episode here and I've really really enjoyed that this opportunity just like you and I had today to spend an hour talking with really smart people about their sport or their athletic journey or coaching or the science and the research. I feel like I've become a much better coach because of it. I've become a much better speaker with more information to provide to people. And so I've really, really enjoyed that piece of it versus, you know, looking up someone's research, writing an article about it, and sort of sharing their stuff, but not really getting to interact with them and ask those probing questions and what made you do this and what did you find and did that surprise you and and things like that. So I've really, really enjoyed that. But I mean, also, I, I just really enjoy speaking. I really enjoy going to communities or to schools and sitting in a room with the coaches and saying, what's your biggest challenge? What do you want to get out of today? Let's get you some good information here so that, you know, we can add to your game or to kids, because a lot of kids are told, you know, hey, you need to be a leader, but they're never taught how to be a leader, right? And then parents, who I think a lot of them are like, they're just kind of scared, and they don't want their kid to miss out, but they're not not quite sure who to believe. And so, hey, can we be a trusted resource that says that this is good, vetted information, here's the research links, here's why we believe this, go ahead and disagree, but, you know, you got to bring something to the table when you disagree, not just, you know, because I don't like what you're saying. Yeah, I think that interaction, whether it's face to face or through the podcast, I think is one of the things that I've enjoyed the most since we started last June is just the opportunity, as you said, to speak to people who have a passion for what they're doing, who have a level of intelligence about coaching or basketball or whatever the case might be, and then to get a chance to pick their brain and not only allow what they know to be shared with our audience, but also just on a selfish personal level, I feel like I've learned a ton through the process of getting a chance to speak with, you know, outstanding individuals like yourself and some of the other guests that we've had on. I feel like it makes me better at the things that I do on a day-to-day basis. And I know that by consuming the content that you put out, whether it's through the podcast, which I listen to all the time, or certainly the blogs, which I've been sharing for years now on my site. Uh, I just think that what you are doing and what <clears throat> you and your team have put together is just, uh, you know, again, it's just a tremendously valuable resource out there. So for anyone who's listening, if you haven't gone on and checked out what John has to offer with the Changing the Game project, I would highly 
recommend that you go ahead and do that. John, before we get out of here today, if you wouldn't mind sharing out your contact information and how people can get in touch with you and interact with what you have going on the Changing the Game project. Sure. So easiest way to get a hold of me directly is just you can just email me, john, J-O-H-N, at changethegameproject.com. Go to the website, changethegameproject.com, and we're always giving away kind of good good information there. Subscribe to the blog or whatever. Subscribe to the podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, all those sort of things. That's called Way of Champions. And then if you consume your information, you can just search for us on Facebook or at CTG Project HQ on Twitter and apparently on Instagram too. I guess we claimed a page two years nice. ago. Never po- We never posted <laughs> anything on it. And I went on there two weeks ago, Reed and I, to get it going. And we had like 1,300 followers. And so I want to apologize to anyone who's been following us for two years on Instagram and wondered why we haven't posted anything. <laughs> well, there, there you go. Yeah, we so. just we just started out. I, I probably had the least familiarity with Instagram of any of the platforms that we're on as well. And so we just started ours recently. So uh, same thing. We spent a lot of time on, on Twitter. A lot of coaches, as you know, are on Twitter. And so we finally get a lot of good interaction there. But John, if there's anything, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to share a parting shot before we get out of here. Um, anything last message you have for our audience? I, I would just say this, right? And this is how we always, Jerry and I always sign off on our podcast is that as a coach, as a parent, as a, an administrator, our influence is never neutral, right? It's always positive or negative. And the more aware we are of our influence, the the greater it is. And so just be aware that everything you do is going to influence your athletes one way or the other. And so be intentional about it because there's there's no way that you can have no impact at all. Couldn't have said it any better myself, John. Thanks for jumping on with us today. We really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast brought to you by Head Start Basketball.